uh, honorable members, good uh, afternoon. Can can you hear me? Yes, Chair, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm in Parliament. I was assigned. I was assigned last night that I must be in Parliament. The, the, the hybrid meeting, I must be in the plenary. Then I had to travel all the way. I left my laptop and the gadgets, other gadgets home in, uh, in the Northwest. I apologize for starting the meeting five minutes late, but nevertheless, be that as it may, uh, you are all heartily welcome to this important meeting of the Select Committee on COCTA, Human Settlements, Water and Sanitation. This is our first meeting of the year after the reopening of Parliament. Let me take this opportunity as the chair of the Select Committee, wish you a very, very successful year under the, the COVID-19 pandemic that is ravaging our, our country and, and, and the world at large. I hope that with the rolling out of the vaccine, it will go a long way in terms of reducing the impact, the negative impact of this virus to our communities and that we are going to settle and operate normally to ensure that we discharge our work as members of parliament in relation to oversight, in relation to lawmaking, in relation to community participation. That is quite important, taking our country forward, given the nature uh, of the challenges that are facing us. And in that sense, I wish all members of parliament, including those who have attended officials and other representatives, a wonderful, a wonderful year. Having said that, I'm, I want to also express our, our sadness that uh, through this pandemic, we have lost one of our outstanding members of parliament who was part of this committee, Honorable Mfayela from KZN in the IFP political party. And let me take this opportunity on your behalf to express our heartfelt condolences to the family of Mfayela, to his political home, the Inkata Freedom Party, and to the people of, uh, of uh, KwaZulu Natal, who, whom uh, Honorable Mfayela dedicated his life to give service to them. And at this point in time, yes, indeed, we have lost a very capable, talented, respect, respectful, and engaging member of our parliament, uh, one of our own. And as I said, I express our heartfelt condolences uh, to in that respect. Having said that, honorable members, we're meeting here to consider the amendment to the Municipal Systems uh, Act. Uh, as it were, you, you, you will reckon and understand that this is a repeat of a, of a process which was started long, long time ago. Uh, an act was passed around 2011 as an amendment to the Municipal Systems Act. The, the whole law was declared unconstitutional by the, by the Concord because of the way it was tacked. And as it were, we are restarting the process afresh. And this time around, I hope that our eyes will be on the ball, will be wide open. We are not going to have the loopholes that led to the nullification of this uh, important bill in the life of local government. It is quite important, this bill, because it must stabilize municipalities, it must regulate how appointments are made at senior level, and it is quite important that we do that because the stability within our municipalities is quite important. And going forward, as I indicated, we must avoid the mistakes of the past, ensure that we are thorough, we are detailed and we do things accordingly. That will ensure that uh, we succeed in that respect. Our agenda is not is not so much detailed. I've just looked at the participants in this uh, in the, in this meeting from the side of members of parliament. Uh, I realize that we're forming a quorum. Uh, overwhelmingly, all members of parliament who are serving in this committee. Uh, are present in the in the meeting and therefore it gives us an opportunity to proceed with our meeting. 
Having said that, uh, let me welcome uh, the department, uh, the delegation from the department. Uh, we, we had a very good engagement with the minister yesterday. Uh, I'm told that the minister is not here, but the DG of the department and other representatives. She, she is here. Oh, the minister she is here. Is here. Uh, my apologies, minister, because I logged late. Uh, I had to rush to take down. I mean, Cape Town, I, my, my heart really apology for that, yes. Uh, I was just making a point that we had a wonderful session with the minister and the team yesterday and that uh, we are pursuing these particular matters in the way that is appropriate and we are quite excited. Uh, having said that, let me invite the Honorable Minister uh, with uh, opening remarks who will also guide us in terms of how we are going to proceed forward in terms of the presentation on this important act uh, of a uh, bill that is before before us. Well, on that note, uh, you are all welcome. Honorable Minister, you are welcome and over to you. Can you take us through that particular process? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members of the Select Committee, and also to the team of officials that is here. Um, I will not do the presentation myself, but I will ask uh, one of my colleagues, Mika Chapin, to lead us in the presentation of this bill. And I'll be here to answer questions if there are any. But um, yeah, let me, let me leave it at that, thank you. Okay, officials from the department, you can take it over. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, and uh, thank you, Honorable Members of Parliament and also the Minister, the DG and uh, colleagues. I will be, my name is Tebu Ho, Motla Suping. I will be taking the uh, committee through the presentation that relates to the Local Government Municipal Systems Amendment Bill that was uh, set uh, before uh, the National Assembly and now has been referred to the NCOP. Uh, can I get uh, to the next slide, which will then just uh, indicate the table of content. And thereafter, that is the overview of the presentation. And uh, as the chairperson has already indicated in relation to where we are in relation to the status of the the act or the bill in 2011, uh, uh, I will then take uh, the committee through the background, but I'll just go through quickly in relation to the background so that when we get to the actual bill, the honorable ministers, are, uh, uh, members are well abreast with regard to the uh, 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 steps that led to where we are now. The next slide, please, is in relation to the, the background. The background, uh, is as the chapter has indicated, it relates to the municipal systems amendment that was introduced in 2011. Uh, it uh, sought to look into municipal councils appointing municipal managers as head of administration and also appointing the senior managers accountable to, directly accountable to the municipal manager. And it also indicated that uh, the, there's a set senior managers that are appointed will then have to have relevant skills, expertise for them to perform their duties. This bill was approved in 19 April 2011 and was ascended by president to be implemented by the 5th of July 2011. Next slide, please. The, the, the bill or the structures in the systems uh, uh, bill at the time prior to 2011 did not prescribe the relevant competencies and expertise, but um, it, as a result of that, municipalities were appointing senior managers in municipalities without having the minimum uh, norms in relation to the uh, standards and the requisite qualification that uh, senior managers ought to have. That particular gap or lacuna led to the disparate human resources practices in municipalities, 
led to the appointment of uh, people without the requisite professional and technical uh, uh, skills. It led to municipalities having under expenditure on capital budgets. It led to ineffective revenue collections. It led to the rule of law collapsing as a result of the surging fraud and corruption. It led to poor service delivery, lack of consequence management, and prolonged labor disputes. So there was a need that the minister will have to get to have regulatory power in order for these issues that have been identified, this inefficiency that has, that has been identified, been closed. Next slide, please. And uh, the process that we had in relation to that bill that started in July 2010, uh, as a result of uh, the turnaround strategy that was led by the late minister, that the, as, as the, 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 the chairperson has already indicated, Parliament time takes it section 75. I'm not going to go too much into all this other matters relating to the process of the bill. I'm safe to indicate that uh, those issues that I have identified in the previous slide were then attended to by the introduction of this amendment of 2011. And uh, the object of the bill as it is the result of responding to the inefficiencies that were identified in local government before the promulgation of the bill in 2011. I won't go too much into this because I will get into detail when I then uh, talk to the proposed amendments that we have. They are almost similar to the amendments that we had. Jefferson, could you please mute your mic? Thanks. Okay. Right. Next slide, please. As, as I've already indicated this uh, now, uh, the impact of that act led to the following governance achievements and issues. One, we made sure that of the minister, of the uh, uh, senior managers that were appointed, all of them, are suitably qualified and competent to be appointed as senior managers. We also introduced the competency framework that laid the foundation for uniform competency requirements for senior managers. We also have the introduction of a competency uh, uh, assessment or tests that were done and compulsory for all senior managers to write the competency test before they can be appointed in municipalities. And all senior managers also participated in the performance management system. It also laid the basis for the evaluation of performance and consequence management for substandard uh, performance for senior managers. It also strengthened the checks and balances by ensuring that municipalities comply with the minimum competency requirements. It, it also contributed to the realization of the ideas of the NDP. It also provided for consequence uh, in relation where appointments are done in contravention with the regulations as promulgated by the minister. It also prohibited the employment of staff found guilty of misconduct. And there was a cooling period between uh, the period of two to 10 years before these people who have been found guilty of misconduct are then appointed in local government. The minister also established a register of all staff members who have been dismissed for misconduct. And such people will then be prohibited uh, from uh, occupying or from being appointed as uh, senior managers. And uh, we had about uh, 130 uh, who resigned prior to the finalization of uh, their cases being finalized uh, in the disciplinary cases. And those names were also included uh, in our database. And uh, as I've already indicated, uh, it linked those challenges that we had. And it also prohibited any other person to be appointed in instances where such positions are not included in the organogram of that particular municipality. This is a milestone of achievement that we had as a result of the impact of the, of the bill and the act that was uh, then ascended to in 2011. Next slide, please. This is just to give uh, uh, members the, and, and, uh, the, the background in relation to the achievement that we had as a result of that and the, the impact of us not, of us having this particular bill that was declared unconstitutional uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in the Constitutional Court. This slide deals primarily in, in a summary from uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Minister. It relates to the court that uh, action that was brought by, 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 by Samu. And we all know 
that uh, on the 9th of March 2011, this particular bill was declared uh, defective and uh, unconstitutional. And it was as a result of the fact that there was a misunderstanding in relation to what should happen after the court order was made uh, in relation to parliament having to uh, uh, deal with the bill or that the, 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 that, uh, the executive was then expected to reintroduce uh, the bill before before parliament and uh, before the, the, the expiry of the deadline that was uh, given to us by parliament. But the long and the short of it is that that 2011 uh, act was then declared unconstitutional. And as a result, the gains that we had uh, as a result of its introduction was then lost. Next slide, please. Now, in consequence of this, uh, the minister revived the bill. It was approved by parliament on the 5th of December, 2018. It was certified by the chief state law advisor on the, on the 20th of December. It was introduced to parliament on the 6th of February, 2019. It was then revived when this sixth parliament came into being. It was then revived uh, in, in, in October, 2019 as a result of uh, the rule 286. And uh, the process as a result of this administrative processes that were then followed. Uh, we then undertook public participation, and these are the uh, organizations, national provincial departments, municipalities, organization, institutions that then responded and were consulted widely so that uh, the bill uh, gets the necessary support uh, from, from, from all, 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 all spheres. The next slide, please. The revival of the bill, as I've already indicated, uh, led to the contributions and uh, comments that we received from Western Cape, Department of Local Government, Houting, uh, uh, Cocta, Mpumalanga, Cocta, Eastern Cape, Cocta, and also uh, Salga. We also received uh, further uh, inputs from Limpopo, uh, Cocta, uh, Coxta, uh, Imatu as a trade union, who also uh, supplied us with written submissions. And uh, we also uh, outer organization for our doing tax abuse and also some that uh, also submitted uh, oral uh, inputs uh, to the portfolio committee. On the 5th of uh, June 2020 and 25th of the, uh, further submissions from Salga and National, uh, National Cocta was then uh, given with regard to the inputs relating to municipal managers and manage managers directly appointed uh, directly accountable to uh, the, the municipal managers. Uh, the, all, the, the, the committee at the time also noted the limitation that was demonstrated least restrictive means to achieve local government and to, to justify uh, uh, the limitation of political rights in terms of section 36 of the constitution. And uh, the committee also was of the view, the committee I'm referring to, the portfolio committee was of the view that uh, this particular clause of limiting uh, political rights should not only be restricted to senior managers, but to all uh, employees of a municipality. The bill was, um, was approved by the National Assembly and it has now been referred to the NCOP for concurrence. It was done on the 4th of December, 2020. I am now going to be dealing with, uh, uh, I don't know what did I do here. Uh, so person, I will request that uh, the, 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 the presentation be screened again. Uh, something occurred here on my screen. But uh, the next point that I'm going to be dealing with is the actual uh, uh, bill itself. I'm going to take the committee clause by clause in relation to the bill as it was in the National Assembly agreed upon and uh, 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 referred to the NCOP. My screen here, I don't know what is happening. It does not show the presentation. May uh, uh, the organizer of the meeting please uh, put the screen back. Isn't it the screen back that we are open? From my side, it is not back. 
Yeah, with us it shows revival of the bill, which is point number five. Yeah, yeah. Oh. From my side here, yeah, the person just uh, went uh, uh, black, blank actually. And you don't have the hard copy. Okay. Uh, yeah, it is. And then uh, uh, I will then just go down to the, uh, the actual bill. Uh, if uh, the 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 organizer can just uh, go to slide number ten. The bill defines uh, the proposed amendment relating to the municipal manager. And uh, uh, the bill defines it as it was defined in relation to the municipal manager being the senior manager in terms of section 54A. It also defines the, uh, what is the uh, definition of political office. Political office referring to the chairperson, the deputy chairperson, the secretary, the treasurer of uh, a political party, and any position that is referred to uh, in, 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 a, in a position of power that is irrespective of the title of chairperson, secretary, uh, treasurer, and all that. That was to include any other in, in some instances where uh, political formations do not utilize the term chairperson, secretary, and all that. So that was to include that so that it becomes all inclusive. Uh, slide number 11. The next slide, please. It refers to the appointment of municipal managers and active municipal managers. This is to give the criteria for the minimum requirements for all senior managers to be appointed uh, uh, in municipalities to have certain requisite expertise qualifications and competencies. And uh, in order for this particular process to be finalized, uh, the minister was given the, uh, uh, the responsibility and the MEC to oversee that when appointments are made, these appointments are made within the prescribed processes, timeframes and in compliance with the regulations. And that also led to, we are also reintroducing the issue of secondment of active municipal managers by uh, MECs or the minister in instances where municipalities require that particular skill and it is not available in municipalities. But those secondments should also be people who are qualified to be appointed as senior managers in municipalities. It will make sure that we do not, municipalities do not appoint or, uh, uh, or the minister or the MEC do not second people who are not suitably qualified as it is in the principal act and uh, the, uh, the, the regulations uh, subsequent to, 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 to the act itself. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. It looks to section 56. It is uh, the appointment of managers directly accountable to municipal managers, that there should be also be a criteria. And these people who are accountable to municipal managers must also have uh, those requisite qualifications, as I've already indicated above, that uh, in instances where these appointments are not made in accordance, the appointment of managers accountable to municipal managers are not appointed in terms of the act and the regulations, the minister or the MEC may step in to inform municipalities that you have not made an appointment in terms with the regulations and the act. And as a result, you must nullify that particular appointment. And there's section 36 that relates to the appointment processes of managers directly accountable to uh, municipal managers. The next uh, clause relates to uh, the substitution of uh, words in section 54A and section 56 of the original act of 2000 that uh, relates to uh, the word municipality and referred to the municipal council. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the section 57 that relates to the employment contract of uh, municipalities or the employment contract of uh, and the performance contract of senior managers in municipalities. It gives, this particular section gives that after an appointment has been made within 60 days, uh, this should be, the contract should be, should, should be, should, should then be concluded between the municipality and the senior manager in instances of a municipal manager and the employment contract and the performance agreement be signed between the uh, municipal manager and managers accountable to uh, a municipal manager. This is relates to now it becomes law that the appointment of a senior manager in municipalities is not con complete unless the employment contract and subsequently the performance agreement have been signed by the council and the municipal manager and by the municipal manager and managers accountable to municipal managers. Next slide, please. The next, uh, it's, 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 it's in relation to what I've already indicated, it's a continuation of uh, that uh, there must be that particular employment contract between uh, the municipality and uh, the, 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 uh, the municipality and the MM and subsequently uh, uh, between the MM and, and managers accountable to, to municipal managers. So that's the introduction of this particular section 57 that uh, makes it that in the event that this is, is, is not being done, the, the whole uh, uh, appointment processes is not concluded unless the result uh, uh, is, is, is void. So we are penning all senior managers, that is uh, uh, MMs and managers accountable to them to then be compl uh, uh, compelled by law to uh, sign an employment contract and the, the, the performance contract of, 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 of senior managers in municipalities. The next uh, clause section, uh, proposed section, it's, uh, it, it relates to, no, the, the next one relates to the section that deals with uh, employment of dismissed staff. Can, we, can I get the next slide, please? I have already indicated that some of the gains that we had was to make sure that uh, senior managers who have been found guilty in one municipality should not resurface in another municipality. So we have now again proposed this particular section that deals with the employment of dismissed staff members and the record of disciplinary proceedings. That the minister will then have to have a database of dismissed staff members and also a, a, a database of uh, staff members who resigned that we have seen happen in municipalities. They resigned before the finalization of the of the of, of the disciplinary processes. And in this instance, when municipalities are to make new appointments, they will have to touch base with the minister or the department in relation to see whether the people that they've shortlisted, that they're interviewing, that they're recommending, whether they appear on the database. And when they appear on the database, then the, the municipality will be informed accordingly in relation to the people appear on the database. And there will be, as I've already indicated, of what happened in the previous act, the calling period in relation to when those people should then be uh, employed again in the sector. This is to clean up the process of getting the rot out of the system for a specified period so that we have uh, uh, clean governance in municipalities. So we are reintroducing this particular clause again. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, this one relates to the uh, staff establishment, section 36. Uh, that provides for the municipal council uh, to have a organogram or uh, the staff establishment in, in, in all municipalities and no person will then be appointed if that position is not in the organogram. We have seen in most instances in municipalities that are not financially viable that uh, you have uh, bloated organograms as a result of the fact that people were, were appointed and there were no such positions in the organogram. So we make it illegal for any municipality to appoint any other person who is not in the organizational structure. So that particular make sure that um, uh, the minister uh, has, uh, has an upper hand in making sure that uh, organograms do, uh, do not have to be bloated and only for purposes of service delivery, only positions that are intended for that particular size of that municipality 
those positions appear on the organogram and no other person should be appointed uh, if, if the person does not appear on the, on the organogram. The next uh, slide, please. It relates to the bargaining uh, council agreements. Now, this one is also important. We have seen that uh, when Salga and Imatu uh, uh, are negotiating in the bargaining council, the salaries that they, that, that they agreed to, to, to for, for staff members below, senior managers, make it difficult for the minister to now regulate and uh, have a notice that determines the proper salaries of senior managers in municipalities. Now, this clause make it compulsory for Salga before there is organized local government. Salga before going to the bargaining council, Salga must touch base with the FFC and touch base with the minister so that the minister can be able to tell them that you must be aware that whatever you negotiate, I have already determined salaries for senior managers and this is the salaries for senior managers. So anything above that, those salaries that I have determined for senior man managers could not be concluded. So we have, we, have, we have identified this as a problem and by introducing this section 71, we are making it compulsory for Salga before going to the bargaining council to touch base with the FFC and also with the minister responsible for local government. Uh, this clause I've already indicated the next one that relates to seven, uh, uh, the proposed section 71B, staff members uh, uh, prohibited from holding political office. As matter stands, as I've already indicated, uh, Chairperson, is that um, the original uh, section that relates to this prohibition of holding political office, it was only for senior managers. But the portfolio committee felt that uh, because of the damage that is there in local government, we'll find out that uh, the chairperson of a, of a, of a branch uh, is a general worker of a municipality, but has a very influence in the decision-making processes of municipalities. And uh, they felt that that should be extended to all staff members in municipalities. They are prohibited from all. They can be members of uh, a political party, they can participate in activities of a political party, but they, they, they are here now prohibited from holding political office. And the political office, I've already uh, discussed it when we dealt with the definitions of what is meant by uh, political, holding political office, chairperson, secretary, and, the, uh, and all those other positions, and any other position of influence in a political party that, that do not necessarily utilize the terms that I've already indicated when I dealt with the definitions. Next slide, please. Uh, this one relates to the regulations and guidelines that the minister will be, in terms of section 32, the minister will be uh, having the power to promulgate uh, regulations in terms of uh, the, this uh, principal act in relation to training competency skills, in relation to the minimum levels of skills, in relation to whatever regulations the minister may have that are, and, and those regulations should not be in conflict uh, with the existing labor laws that relates to your medical aid, pension funds and all that. So the minister has already done that in the uh, previous uh, 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 systems bill of, of systems act of 2000, 2004 and 2008. And we are now putting section 72 for the minister also to be given the power to regulate minimum norms and standards in municipalities so that there should be standardization and not uh, having uh, haphazard uh, 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 policies adopted by municipalities. This one led to the non-performance. It also gives the minister in instances where there are allegations of uh, corruption, maladministration, non-performance, the minister in instances where uh, uh, the, the MEC does not act in relation to all those allegations. This gives now the minister to directly engage and investigate all those uh, allegations of maladministration, fraud, corruption, and uh, also non-performance. So this one also empowers the minister in instances where MECs are not uh, acting to the allegations, the minister can directly do that. I think we are now getting to the end of the presentation. Next slide. The section 120, that was already there, 
but uh, uh, because of the uh, invalid, in, in, invalidity of uh, 2011, we are now reintroducing again this section that deals with uh, the processes of uh, uh, the minister to uh, regulate and also to uh, develop guidelines in local government. The only person who is allowed by law is in terms of section 70, section 72, section 120, is the minister responsible for local government to determine the regulations, guidelines, policies in municipalities. The next one relates to the voting. Uh, it, it relates to uh, any other councillor who vote in favor or agree to a resolution which is before council or committee of council that is in conflict with the applicable uh, legislation, uh, 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 local government legislation, they will be personally be liable for having taken such wrong decisions and voting wrongly in municipal councils. That is uh, my presentation, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members and uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you very much for, for the presentation. As I indicated, this is a beginning of the process to ensure that this bill becomes an act of parliament which is very much important in the life of, of local government as a sphere of, of government. Now, honorable members, in terms of the process, because this is the beginning, as you know, that immediately after this engagement, we are going to have a situation whereby we publish this uh, bill in the newspapers for for comments by the public, and that we are going to schedule meetings with the provinces, where provinces and municipalities are going to make some contributions in terms of Section 76 process. And thereafter, the matter will come to the NCOP uh, for the negotiating mandate, and lastly for the final mandate in terms of the process itself. I'm raising this because as we ask questions, and then clarity seeking questions, we should know that this is the beginning of the process that we are going to unfold as the, as the NCOP. Can I open to honorable members to ask questions uh, to, and to make some, some remarks, take into consideration the fact that uh, we should be done before two o'clock because at two o'clock there is a, a sitting of parliament. Uh, over to you, honorable members. Any clarity seeking questions? Can you just indicate by show of hand that uh, you, or oh, I pick up Honorable Shaikh and who else? For now, you are the only one, Honorable Shaikh. Over to you. Oh, yes, you'll follow. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, yeah, I, I think you've explained the pr process that will follow. Um, and I understand that we will also have be able to further engage with this goal uh, in, in the various provinces uh, that we come from. Um, I just want, I just have, while I'm okay with, you know, the explanation uh, for the rest, the rest of the poll, um, I just want to, I just have one question. Uh, and I also have an understanding in terms of um, staff members not holding political office, but uh, ca can, can we get a further explanation in terms of the rationale uh, behind, behind this and whether it does not impact on other rights of individuals? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Sileku. Honorable Sileku. Oh, thank you very much, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah. No, Chair, mine is just a, a, a clarity seeking question. If, in terms of Clause 2 and Section 54A, when it comes to appointments and the, of municipal management, and I think the proposed amendment says, 
if the minister or the MEC in, in the province that not, does not respond in the required time. So that particular appointment would be deemed like they have followed the required prescription. And then automatically that particular candidate will be appointed as a municipal manager. My question is that I'm opening a loophole for, for ministers or MECs not to respond to that so that, you know, dodgy candidates or in municipalities, because when you go to municipalities, unfortunately, people are appointed. And then our only hope is that the MEC or the minister would actually say, no, this particular candidate does not meet the required uh, pre prerequisites and criteria due to X, Y, and Z. But now when they say a minister does not respond, couldn't we compel and say maybe they must respond so that we don't open a loophole? It's just, can you just clarify on that one? And then the second one, Chair, you know, Chair, I really agree and I full heartedly support that the office bearers in political parties should not uh, occupy senior positions. But Chair, now the thing is, how are we going to make sure that candidate A or candidate B is not a member in good standing or is not a leader in a particular branch of a particular municipality? What checks and balances is there? And also Chair, is there no potential for people that are recognized for certain position in municipalities knowing that this particular law says, if you are a office bearer, for people that instead of becoming office bearers, then they be just become ordinary members in a particular organization. But so that we open a door for them to be members or to be appointed, they would sacrifice those positions, but they are still active in their different communities. So. I just need more explanation in terms of how are we going to monitor and make sure that what, what the bill wa wants to achieve actually does achieve what we want to see. And Chair, on the last one, when it comes to the, to the staff establishments, my question, Chair, is that at the end of the day, the prerogative of uh, a point of approval of a staff, staff establishment entirely the uh, is highly, highly up to a particular council. So how are we going to make sure as this, uh, in, in this particular bill that when a staff establishment or organogram that is approved, that it is affordable and it is there to assist the, the municipality and it is there to make sure that services are rendered. Because Chair, we have seen in municipalities that staff establishments is being approved by councils and just to sort out cadres, uh, to sort out people and people just get paid. They don't do any work. So how are we going to make sure going forward that before a municipal council actually uh, approves a particular staff establishment that that is that is the cheapest and affordable for that particular municipality and also chair i just oh, and also chair the other one is that does the staff establishment include temporary positions as well how are we going to deal with temporary positions because what we also to see chair in the office of the executive mayors you will find uh, program directors, you'll find program managers on temporary basis. Uh, does the staff establishments, you know, deal with such issues as well? Uh, and the last one, Chair, I just need clarity, you know, in terms of the contract of the MM, because 
I don't know whether I read it correctly. It says uh, an MM can be appointed on a, on a fixed term contract or it, the council can decide whether they appoint the MM on a permanent basis. Can I just you know, get clarity on those few questions? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Silek. I see that uh, there are no other hands from members of parliament. Now, because we have representatives from provinces and, and Salga, can I check uh, with you whether do you want to pose some questions? Uh, if, if so, can you just raise your hands so that I know uh, delegates from Salga and our provinces? So that in case that you want to also ask questions. Yes, in, in the absence of that, from, from my side, uh, there are two points. Firstly, when this law was passed in 2011, it was heralded as a very, very good law because it was now regulating appointments at municipal level and looking at the qualifications and ensuring that people appointed as municipal managers and senior managers were having the minimum uh, requirements for the job uh, applied for. And suddenly that stopped because of the judgment of the Constitutional Court. Now, my question is, what is the difference between that law that was passed in 2011 and the current bill, notwithstanding the areas which were identified by the, by the concord as problematic, especially as they relate to the occupation of uh, positions by political parties or office bearers, uh, prohibiting uh, municipal officers uh, from occupying those particular positions. What are other differences? Is there any addition or subtraction from, from that kind of law? Because my view is that this, this law was okay. And coming from my province, it was really, really uh, working very well because municipalities wouldn't just appoint people without the necessary expertise. And since that particular process, uh, it became a very, very serious problem. That's the first one. The second one relates to the suspension of the invalidity uh, with regard to this. The Concord had given this process 24 months to be completed. And the date of 2019 came and, 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 and Parliament had not actually even started with the process. I want to establish what was the problem because that contributed, in my view, in terms of the situation where municipalities began again to appoint unqualified and unsuitable uh, senior managers with impunity because there was nothing at all, whether the law or the regulations proclaimed by the minister to regulate uh, that situation. And then my, 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 my question is, what were causing the delays and how in this case, this time around, that we are going to ensure that we prevent those delays to ensure that this process is smooth, is efficient, and is expedited in a way that will ensure that it contributes to the stability at, at municipal level. Uh, Honourable Minister, over to you. Those are the remarks and, and questions. Uh, you will uh, determine how you want uh, this to uh, the, Thank the you very much. Thank you very much, Honourable Chairman, for the answers, for, for, for the questions. I'll first ask the officials to answer, then I'll fill up the gaps. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson, and uh, thank you, Honorable Minister. I will deal with uh, some of the issues here, and uh, there are colleagues also in the meeting who might add. Uh, the issue of uh, the rationale behind the 
prohibition of holding of political office. Like I indicated that initially, it was only a restrictive clause to senior managers, but now after the deliberations in the portfolio committee, it was agreed that this should be extended to, to everyone. The rationale behind this, as uh, honorable members will, will know that uh, uh, the limitation of political rights is there in the constitution. And uh, it is in terms of section 36 in the constitution that there are instances where you have to limit certain political rights of, of uh, uh, members of society. Uh, in this particular instance, there was an issue or a prevalent issue that related to uh, politicizing local government administration. That uh, there were instances where senior officials who were appointed at the time were holding political office and as a result being senior to the political office bearers of a municipality that is the mayor, the speaker, the deputy mayor, and councillors, that they were politically senior to them. And as a result, they could not instill oversight as a result of the fact that the senior managers were now occupying a, 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 a political office. It was then agreed, it's a matter of experience over years, that in order to have local government administration being professionalized and not politicized, we then, uh, there was an agreement that this particular clause has to be included so that there should be stability. There were instances where a municipal manager who is a senior in a political party will then be suspended by the mayor and council during the day and at night because the person holds a senior position in a political party, then subsequently at night suspend. The, 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 the mayor or even uh, the speaker. So in order to bring that stability, in order to have that particular depoliticization of uh, the local government administration in particular, this clause was then uh, uh, suggested. And I must indicate honorable members, uh, and I think the chairperson will also be testimonial to the fact that uh, this particular clause brought some sort of stability because uh, administration was left then to administrators and councillors in the municipal council will then deal with political matters. So having that, 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 that uh, uh, clear interface between the administration and the political arm of a municipality, that brought some sort of stability. That is why uh, the, the, the portfolio committee felt that uh, this clause should only not relate to uh, senior managers, but it should be extended to all staff members of a municipality. But the NCOP will then have to dis, uh, discuss and see whether is this uh, really feasible or not under the circumstances. But that was our argument all along that uh, we need to depoliticize local government administration. Uh, the next one, uh, uh, and, and just in, in, uh, 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 in addition to that, there was a question in relation to how will we then know and make sure that these people who are holding political office are not um, appointed in municipalities. From the administrative point of view, what we did was to develop a template or a form like your Z88, a form that is included in the regulations. And in that uh, particular uh, form, when you apply to be appointed in municipalities, there is a section that relates to your disclosure of your political involvement in the definition of political office. And in the event that uh, you, you, you hold political office, you will then be precluded from being employed in the municipal space. But if you give wrong disclosure in relation to your involvement at the, of holding of a political office, once that becomes aware after your appointment, that appointment will then be declared void up in issue. So that is the administrative way of trying to make sure that uh, we follow up this and we try to trace to make sure that these people are not appointed. Whether that is enough or not, but that administratively, the, we, we have some sort of limitations in relation to uh, making sure that this, part, this particular candidate belongs or, or holds a particular political office. But by putting it in that form that is compulsory for any other member to, 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 to fill, 
and to submit uh, 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 when they are applying. You don't apply with a CV, you apply with that particular prescribed form that the minister has determined. We will then follow that up to make sure that people are not uh, holding political office. The next question was in relation to the loophole. That is one of, uh, in answering, uh, in answering these questions, I'll be touching on the second question that the chairperson was asking about um, uh, the, the new things, the new things that we introduce in the act. Now, this particular clause is one of the new clause that we, 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 we suggested and supported by the, by, by the portfolio committee. When the process of selection and recruitment of senior managers in municipalities takes place, because there were no cut and fast rules in relation to the timelines, it took a very long time for this process to be finalized of appointing a senior manager. Now that created a problem and uh, the discussion, especially in the manner in which this question was asked, was also debated at length in the portfolio committee. Was that um, if the appointment process is totally complete after the MEC, after the minister, has uh, issued a, a view in relation to the process, whether they've been followed correctly and the person is suitably qualified. But there were instances where MECs, for example, were not uh, timelessly submitting reports to the minister. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, we will only become aware as a department after a year or so that the person who's been appointed is in actual fact not doubly qualified. But because this particular report only came to the minister after a, month, after a year or so, it became difficult for the minister to say, but you, you, you have been appointing a wrong person all along. And in order to have that curtailed, it was agreed that we must then force MECs and ministers in reporting to the minister on the appointment processes to be done. And in the event that MECs do not respond in time, 14 days after the, uh, the, uh, after the, the, the appointment of senior managers, must then submit that report to the minister. We are including this clause that says that that particular appointment shall be deemed to have been, that the person shall, shall be deemed to be uh, uh, correctly appointed with the requisite skills and, and, and the intention of this clause. Uh, there were some other uh, suggestions that were made in relation to some sort of punitive measures on, on, on in instances where reports are not timelessly being given to the ministers for the minister to form an opinion. But uh, the portfolio committee at the time agreed that this is the most possible way of making sure that MECs are then given the responsibility once councillors have appointed, once MECs have both received the reports, then the MEC must timelessly give those reports to uh, the minister so that the minister can then conclude the process in relation to the suitability of, of appointment of senior managers. Now, uh, relating to the staff establishment, uh, how will we then make sure that uh, the organogram is fit for purpose? The whole process here is to make sure that um, we do not even have to have what we call temporary uh, uh, staff people in, a, in an establishment. An establishment, a staff establishment will be an organogram that has been uh, deliberated upon in, in the municipal council and adopted. And only those positions in the organogram should be the one that have been filled. No any other positions can be made. So it is illegal for you to make any payment to any person who is appointed, whose position is not in the staff establishment. Now to answer the fit for purpose, the minister is now, uh, uh, the department through the minister finalizing what we called Organo, uh, uh, prototype organograms. Now we have developed, which are now going to put on uh, in, into implementation phase in municipalities. The department has developed prototype organograms for different sizes uh, of and categories of municipalities. So municipalities will not be having any other uh, staff establishment from another municipality, customize it and put it in place. Whereas for purposes of effective service delivery, the municipality might necessarily have to have a particular uh, organogram. So we have made sure that we have now established, we have now developed prototype organograms. And once municipalities are reviewing their organograms, they will then be doing in accordance 
with the prototype organogram developed by the minister responsible for local government. So in that way, we make sure that municipalities, small municipalities do not take organograms of big municipalities and metro and try to put them cut and paste in a small municipality. We are developing, we have developed organograms that are fit for purpose for all types, all size, all categories of municipalities for municipalities to follow suit. So we will make sure that municipalities have fit for purpose organograms in municipalities. The contract of MMs and senior managers uh, uh, accountable. The contract for an MM is for a period of five years and not exceeding one year after local government elections or the term of office of that particular council. So it's a fixed term contract of uh, a period of five years. So MMs is for five years and not for more than one year exceeding the term of, uh, of that particular uh, 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 council. Senior managers, uh, there, is, there will be a discussion based on the experience of uh, municipalities. That is managers accountable to municipal managers. If circumstances in a particular municipality warrants for the municipality to have a discussion whether they appoint them on a fixed term contract or a permanent contract, that based on the circumstances of, each, of the municipality will then uh, uh, appoint them on a fixed term contract or, or on, a, on, a, on, a, on a permanent basis. But it will depend on the circumstances of uh, each unique case in the municipality. Uh, the, going to the questions that were asked by uh, the chairperson. Chairperson, when we introduce this bill or reintroduce this bill to, 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 to parliament, to the fifth administration, we reintroduced it as it was in 2011. So, so, so there were, as it was, and there were transitional measures that were put in place. Uh, but when the bill was discussed in the portfolio committee, there were certain inclusions, new inclusions in the bill. Uh, I've already touched on, on the one relating to the NC report, uh, uh, to the minister timelessly, and they were putting, that was uh, the, the, the new inclusion. The second inclusion was relating to holding a political office that uh, they should be uh, extended to everyone. There was uh, uh, the one relating to uh, the uh, contract of uh, uh, contract of employment of senior managers, accountable to municipal managers. That has to be clarity in relation to what then be followed. And uh, because of the inputs from other stakeholders in relation to uh, what we then proposed initially, that uh, senior managers accountable to municipal managers be appointed on a permanent basis. But we have since, during the discussion, uh, agreed that uh, there should be a discretion or, or hybrid approach in relation to uh, managers accountable to senior managers in terms of the terms of contract. So that was also the new inclusion. But as matter stands, uh, that was uh, 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 the bill that we introduced as it was in 2011. That is why in my presentation, we started by indicating what was then in 2011, what we achieved as a result of the 2011 uh, uh, act. And because of the challenges that were made as a result of the invalidity, we then had to uh, put this clause as it were in 2011 to make sure that uh, we follow up in relation to appointments of senior managers with suitable uh, 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 competencies, experience and qualifications. The, 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 the last point uh, from my side will be in relation to the delays that led to the invalidity. Uh, we, we, we are aware that the sub at the time when they challenged this, it was uh, in relation to this clause of uh, limitation of political rights. And uh, we were given uh, a period into which uh, the Constitutional Court said this was tagged incorrectly. And because of the process, the Constitutional Court did not give its view in relation to the substantive matter, which is the uh, limitation of political rights. What then happened was the court directed that this process of tagging would then have to be done within a specified period so that uh, it must be corrected. And this should be tagged as section 76 and not as section 75 bill. 
Now, the department does not take bills, but parliament through its uh, taking machinery and committee will then take. So uh, there was a misunderstanding in relation to what would be then the, be the process. Minister Des Van Rooyen at the time wrote a letter to parliament to say, according to the constitution, you are taking and please take accordingly and we'll give you technical support. After some time, the understanding was but the executive was supposed to have um, reintroduced the bill to, 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 to parliament. So the discussion in relation to the misunderstanding and misinterp uh, uh, different interpretations of the processes that then had to unfold during that period that uh, the constitutional court gave uh, uh, for purposes of, of, of uh, checking the bill correctly created a lapse. And uh, when we went to court under Minister Mkize, to try to get an extension. There was a problem in relation to that and the court then said, we're not going to give you an extension. And as a result, this is declared now unconstitutional. But what we did in that process of invalidity, the department has already established a forum with, with provinces, with SALGA, of making sure that we meet every quarter to make sure that suitably qualified personnel are appointed. We looked into the regulations that the minister had, and the, the regulations were made in terms of uh, section uh, 72 and section 120 of the act in its original form of 2000. So the, the, the regulations in as far as it related to the Municipal Systems Act of 2000, of 2000 amendments of 2004, amendments of 2008, which were not declared unconstitutional were then effective. And we continued to monitor appointments of senior managers in municipalities in accordance with the regulations set down by the minister that were not declared in invalid. So all along on a quarterly basis, we have followed this up and we have made sure that only suitable qualified uh, uh, officials are appointed in municipalities. Some provinces tried to interpret differently to say that, but if the principal act is invalid, it therefore means that the regulations are invalid. We met as government in terms of national and provincial department and SALGA, and we have agreed that the correct interpretation is that any other regulation that relates to 2011 amendments were the ones that were nullified, but all the other regulations that were done in accordance with the original systems act are applicable and municipalities are obliged to then follow uh, the processes of appointing suitably qualified officials. And we then, the minister then issued a circular to all municipalities and say, follow the regulations and appoint a W qualified person. Whilst we are having this process of reintroducing the bill that will then address other issues that were declared unlawful in terms of uh, the ruling of 2011. So we have, we have, we have uh, 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 as a department and together with our provinces, we have made sure that we may we, we, we monitor the appointments of senior managers in accordance with them having the necessary qualifications, the necessary competencies. All of them are being assessed even today. Uh, they write uh, uh, the, 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 the assessment uh, tests. And uh, as a result of that, we can clearly say that in instances where wrong people were appointed, we had intervened in the process during this time of invalidity of 2011. Thank you, Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members and Honorable Minister. Uh, Honorable Chair, I'll just add something. Um, I think the, the very first question that was asked, um, indeed, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that I think we will still be challenged in court because that was the, the, the reason why this was taken to court in the first place. But we do believe that as, the, as has been said, that there is an allowance of limitation of rights if there is a good reason why you are limiting the rights and also the extent of the limitation. Now the extent of the limitation is only as far as office bearing is not that you can't belong to a political party. You can belong to a political party, but you can't hold office. And I think 
insofar as that limitation is concerned, is not, um, an, it's a limitation, I think, that is, is relevant to what we are trying, to the mischief we are trying to address. So, but I'm quite sure that it will still be, they will take it to court once it's, it's passed. But we will be able to explain why, because of the experience that uh, we have seen over the years of how if officials are office bearers, they can undermine even decisions of their uh, principals who are overseeing them. So I just wanted to, to add that, that uh, we have not, I have no doubt that it will be taken to court because they will argue that we are limiting their rights. But I think it, it's, it's a partial limitation of that right. It's not a complete limitation. Uh, and in so far as the, the, the loop, In, insofar as the loophole is concerned, I think that question has been answered, but um, it, it's, it's probably true that there could be a loophole because if, if the law says if you have not answered, it means it's deemed to have been um, the qualifications and and the process is deemed to have been adequate. I think if someone wants to be mischievous, they can delay. If someone wants to be mischievous. Honorable Butler, can you please mute your mic? OK, sorry for that, Honorable okay. Minister. Sorry, Jay. No, I was. Uh, I was just saying that we, we, sh we should just make sure that we, we don't, uh, I, I agree that we, we shouldn't open a loophole where somebody can maybe pretend to have sent the information when they haven't sent it, only so that then there will be no response. And after that, they can then say, well, or send, the, or send the information very late so that the response doesn't come in there during the, the, the period that it's supposed to come. So I think we should just see that we don't open that loophole. I agree with the honorable a member who's raised that. But I, otherwise, I think the, for now, the, 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 the questions have been responded to. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable uh, Minister, for, for the responses. As I indicated, this is the beginning of a process from the side of the NCOP to facilitate the passage of this, of this law. And, and last year, just last year in December, we, we passed the amendments to the Municipal Structures Act. And Honorable Minister, we worked very, very well, very, very close with your department. Uh, they assisted us in terms of the whole process, in terms of the engagements in our provinces. And the process was very, very good. And in that sense, we were able in December last year, be in the position to pass the amendments to the Municipal Structures Act. I'm going to request that this time around, we, we do the same in terms of the proposed amendments to the Municipal Systems Act, ensure that we follow the same, the same process. Because this, in my view, will be very, very much helpful, especially in the light of the fact that this law was declared unconstitutional by the Constitutional Court. We need to ensure that we tighten up all the loopholes and, and we work accordingly to ensure the realization of those particular objectives. As I indicated, uh, we are going to publish 
this uh, notice in the papers. We are going to develop a program of how we are going to interact and brief the provinces. And I'm going to request that please, please, in the provinces, ensure that municipalities are involved, ensure that all the stakeholders at municipal level are involved, especially the union, SAMU and IMATU and all other uh, stakeholders are very much important that they participate in this process and they are properly uh, consulted. And thereafter, from our side, as the NCOP, we will ensure that we move accordingly to ensure that at the end of the day, uh, the bill is watertight, is adopted in a way, as I indicated from the beginning, that it will add value, it will contribute in the stabilization of our system of local government. On that note, uh, thank you very much for the briefing. And once more, thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for your attendance uh, and presentation to, to this committee. And I also, in the same vein, would like to thank all other stakeholders, provinces, uh, municipalities, Salga, and everybody for having attended this meeting. Uh, this meeting is agent. And as I indicated, we are going to embark on this important process. On that note, uh, thank you very much. The meeting is closed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much.